So that was the Falklands. And uh, before that, two years before that, we had the Iranian embassy. And the Iranian embassy was, uh, I, w I was on the top floor going in from the roof. But it's all part of being the team, you know? But I had the job of uh, lowering the explosive above the stairwell, you know, the big glass dome above the stairwell. And that was basically the distraction explosion. So if anybody watches the Iranian embassy little BBC clip on YouTube, um, there's a big explosion and there's some uh, journalists going, that was a bomb, that was a bomb. And then you then see the lads climbing out, you know, the, the, the four lads of the 30,000 that climb out onto the, the front balcony that everybody's seen. Bob, how are you, mate? I'm very well, Chris. How are you, mate? Oh, I'm absolutely just made up that you, you, you've joined me, Bob. Um, for our friends at home, Bob has had such a fascinating career. I'm always talking about you get one life, get out there and smash it because there's no, you don't get another go at it, right? The gentleman I'm talking to today, former... Um, sergeant major in the special air service just to name one of bob's um, previous achievements i've got bob's website here so excuse me if i'm looking across to it but it even just the the look of his website is 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 just fascinating in itself before we go any further please folks could you subscribe and if you'd even give the video a like, that, that would be great. Um, because I'm inundated with mails to say this is everybody's favourite podcast. And it should be because we, we get guests like this uh, and we tell the truth, which is not something you're going to see the, the celebrities doing. Um, but when you look at the figures for the podcast, you can see all these people writing and saying, Great pot aren't subscribed. So that's really, really um, stifling us friends from, from growing bigger um, and then being able to have more to invest and, and get a better quality of everything. So please like and subscribe. Bob, sorry about all that, that spiel, but that's the nature of uh, YouTube, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever thought of having a... A YouTube channel or, or do you have one? Yeah, if I was a, a young lad like you, I'd probably think about it. But, uh, you know, I'm uh, very long in the tooth now and uh, it takes me uh, all my time just keeping up with, um, you know, writing an email or <laughs> sitting on Facebook chatting to my mates and stuff, you know. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of people younger than me, more in date than me, more active than me, that are doing a great job out there, keeping in, people informed and interested, and uh, I'll leave it to them. I'll sit back and enjoy it all. Bob, the thing I, I really appreciate about being able to meet somebody like yourself and, and to host you on the, on the podcast is you're, you're showing the public that there's a completely different persona to the British forces, particularly, I'm just going to say special forces or, or elite forces, then, then the public, pu public probably perceive. 
everybody I speak to are just thoroughly humble, thoughtful, kind, nice, <laughs> nice, nice people. And that was when we had you. You, I got a phone call, friends from New York the other day, and I thought, who's calling me from New York? <laughs> I wondered if it was uh, Andy Ruffle, the BMX legend. And lo and behold, it was Bob. And we just had the most amazing chat, which um, in which I was able to ask him all my sort of questions, particularly um, around the Bravo 20 patrol, because for many of you who know, Bob Consiglio left the Royal Marines to join the SAS and then was subsequently the, the first person to be killed in the first Gulf War. So we've all got um, obviously a, a vested interest there. And yes, Bob, I, I just want to thank you. It was a great chat and, and here you are. That's my pleasure, mate. Thank you. I've, um, I live on the edge of the Bronx, just outside New York City. And uh, since about six o'clock this morning and it's just gone eight, AM now, we're five hours behind UK. For those that don't know, I've got two helicopters circling right above my house. Now, I don't know if it's linked into this podcast <laughs> or if they're actually observing somebody else over in the Bronx. Um, I'm hoping it's the latter. But uh, if any, you know, if you do pick up a droning noise, that's what it is. So mm. I apologize. I have to say, you look the furthest place from the Bronx. That that, that I'd ever imagine. <laughs> In fact, uh, I've just been showing my little boy um, coming to America. Uh, the Eddie Murphy film, was it like 30 years old now or something, or it's, it's quite old, it was 20, 20 years, 25 years old. And um, they're in Queens. And yet one of the one of the characters does the apartment up from this rat infested, cockroach infested slum to this luxury <laughs> pad. And it's and it's reminding me of. Um, yeah, people get the impression, I think, from films that the Bronx is this hard arse side of town. Well, it does have that. But uh, there's multi-million dollar apartments and houses in the Bronx, too. And it also has a coastline and there's a little spit of land goes out. Um, called City Island, which is part of the Bronx, and it's stunning, you know. The, the, um, so it's a big area. Uh, there's the beautiful side and the not so beautiful side, mm. and you certainly uh, there are times where you speed through in your vehicle and you wouldn't get out. Um, you know, I think with with COVID and the situation and uh, the state of the economy because of the laws um, that we all have to adhere to because of COVID. There's a lot of people on their arse right now and they're all sitting in places like the Bronx. So, you know, there are problems. There's more shootings, more knifings, more abductions. Um, so you do have to be careful. But, uh, you know, it's, it's bad times at the moment. Um, and of course, everybody's wishing for things to pick up. You know, the sun's out now, it's another year. Um, we'll see where it all goes. Yeah. Well, why do you think it is that, that British soldiers are like much tougher than the Yanks? Yeah, you can say that. Uh, sitting in America, I, I think I'll, uh, I'll leave that one out. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's funny you say that. I've got a lot of friends here who are ex-military, Vietnam vets and all the rest of it. There's a couple of youngsters. One's a firefighter now. He was in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we, you know, we'll have a coffee together or a beer and, and chat. And it's just like chatting to my mates, you know? It's like chatting to Marines, Paris, all the other cat badges. We're all the same, you know? We all joined the military for one reason or another. You know, many are like myself where, you know, we came from a bit of a hard-nosed background and uh, there wasn't a lot to sit around and wait for. So we got out of town and, and we joined the military. And it gave us a life. And, uh, you know, that, that goes towards a, an awful lot of American lads and lasses as well, even today, you know. They join it to get an education, whether that's uh, an education on paper or just an education of uh, growing up in, in the big bad world, you know. Yes. So I, I see us as the same. Kindest, 
kindest people on earth, the Americans. That's... Well, wherever you go in the world, the Americans stand out and, uh, you know, with their trainers on. And... <laughs> yeah. Tennis socks. And their baseball caps and their T-shirts. And, and they are absolutely likeable. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, there's an awful lot of uh, things wrong with America uh, that I can see as a non-American living here. Um, but that can be fixed. And, uh, you know, there's an awful lot wrong back home as well, you know. And hopefully that will get fixed too. I find it very hard being a guy in his late 60s now going to see a doctor for a checkup. And all the doctor's trying to do is sell you Big Pharma because that's who he represents. And you're having to go through a for-profit driven insurance company to see the doctor. It's absolutely ludicrous. And, mm. the, the, you know, if you do have Big Pharma because you really need it, it costs a fortune here. And how come it, you know, the same Big Pharma made in America is cheaper in the UK than it is buying it in a pharmacy in America. You know, there's, you know, the, the, the rich get richer and uh, the rest of us just flounder, you know? Yes. Um, and that needs sorting, it really does. They get rich in pocket and, and poorer in spirit, don't they? Yeah, yeah. They, I, they, don't, they don't get yeah, it. Yeah, and, and that's the way life is, you know? It's, um, you know, I, I, I wander around with my bulldog. If I'm not running, I'm walking my bulldog and uh, I've had shouts from people from across the road and, and, and the street's been pretty empty for me and my bulldog and the person across the road shouting at me, where's your mask? And, uh, and I say, well, you know, I don't wear a mask outside, especially when I'm across the road from you. It's in my pocket and I'll put it on if I need to. Um, why don't you lose weight? <laughs> to which you know, the head goes down and the person continues up the road. And nobody's addressing this. We're all addressing social distancing, wear a mask, wash your hands. Nobody's addressing the real elephant in the room, if you like, which is the obesity problem and the problem that everybody's on Big Pharma. They're, therefore, combined, their immune system is really low. And everybody's had over a year now to sort themselves out. Get up in the morning, look yourself in the mirror and say, is the problem me? Mm. And maybe when you go out, you won't be throwing at the, prob the problem at other people and accusing them, you know? The issue, Bob, is that there's about five elephants in the room. But because, oh. because everyone watches their mainstream media and they're, you know, that thing in the corner of the room and they get shown those five elephants all day long, every single day that, They've learned just to think that that's normal. Yeah, the mainstream media won't cover the realities because uh, it's bad for clicks. Mm -hmm. You know, they won't get the attendance that they seek. And um, so, especially over here, you've either got left, left wing media or right wing media. You know, um, if, if you're a Republican, you watch Fox News and you listen to all their crap. And if you're a Democrat, you listen to CNN, NBC, and, you know, you get all their crap. And that just keeps the country divided. I, I find it hard living here that 350-ish million people and there's only two major political parties. And, uh, you know, all my friends around here, my neighbours, they're either on one side or they're on the other. Nobody's in the middle. So, you know, I believe if, let's say, you had five major political parties because you know the country's big enough to swallow it all up you would have uh, an imbalance when it comes to voting and it would be like three against two or whatever not one against one and you know that's a big problem here and i think it's kept like that for a reason you know yeah keep keep the people divided Bob, I'm conscious of um, your your wonderful time that you're extending us, and this is all stuff that we that I talk about on my channel a lot. I go one further and say all the media, all the politicians, are all controlled by the sociopaths. So I, I'm not buying into any of it. Um, I never voted, never will, not going to vote for my own slavery in a corrupt system. Sorry. Yeah. Um, 
don't own a, a certain thing that you mentioned. I'm not going to say the word, but I don't even have one. Yeah. Um, someone's got to stand up to these fuckers, you know, because our colleagues died for this freedom, this this freedom that we've now just given away without any fight whatsoever. Um, and I don't care about an old dog like me. I could die tomorrow, mate. I'll, I'll be more than happy, right? I've had I've had the perfect life. But but when you got kids. I, I, I think in my late 60s, retired, I try to keep myself fit as much as I can. But I do do a lot of sitting down and reflecting. I love gardening. I've got a fairly big garden outside. So yesterday I was cutting the grass and my mind was wandering all over the place. You know, my first war as a 17-year-old, the secret war in Dofar, Oman, to... You know, my last war, which really was the first Gulf War and attending modern day wars as a civilian looking after um, journalists in, in war zones. And I'm thinking all this out and, uh, you know, after a bad beginning where I didn't get a formal education um, in Dundee, Scotland, I ran away from home. I ended up in Bristol. I tried to be a footballer. I failed at that. And somebody suggested go down the road to the recruiting office and join the military. And I thought, wow, that's a great idea. So uh, I, I just approached my 17th birthday. Somebody actually told me to go and join the Paras. So I go down to the recruiting office and uh, the Navy, Royal Marines, Air Force, Army, it's all in the same street. And so I'm walking down the street to join the paras and I come to the recruiting office on the right with a big paratrooper in the window coming down underneath, drifting down under his canopy. And I walk in and I say, excuse me, is this where, where I come to join the paras? Sit down, son, sign here. And unbeknown to me, because I didn't look up when I walked through the door, it was the RAF recruiting office and I just joined the RAF regiment which actually had a parachute squadron. It was a field squadron with a parachute role. And that's what I ended up joining. And that was the kickoff to an absolutely fantastic career. Mm. And had I gone on down the street and walked into the Army Careers Office or the Navy one and joined the Marines, I may well have been much later in life in joining the Special Forces, if at all. And uh, I say that because at 17, after doing recruit training in my jumps course, I was sent straight out to the secret war in Dofar because our unit was under man. And I had to sign forms for special dispensation because I was under the age of 18. I think there was two of us actually that went out there off the same you know, pre-para course. And, uh, and that's where I saw the SAS. We were. Um, we were guarding the Salala airfield, which was on the coastline in Dofar, which is a southern province in Oman, which borders Yemen. And there was a, a four mile in depth from the coastline to the base of the mountains, plain at, at coastline level. And then, you know, a thousand odd feet up into the mountains at nighttime from my defensive base which we called hedgehogs. They were basically defensive positions built up like Sangers because it was bedrock on the Salala Plain, bedrock and gravel, you couldn't dig down. So we, we built these defensive positions called hedgehogs um, out of oil drums, ammunition containers, sandbags. And, um, and that was our fort. That's where we fought from. And at night, I'd see the green tracer going in, the red tracer coming out, the explosions in the air, three and a half to four miles away, up in the Jebel, the mountains. And I'd say to my sergeant, who's that up there? And he's like, that's an SAS patrol getting hit and getting stuck in. And, I, and I'm like, who are the SAS? Oh, that's uh, the Special Air Service. There are special forces. And uh, 
And from that moment on, at 17 years old, I never even shaved. I looked like a 14 year old. I was way behind in puberty. <laughs> you know, I was just like a little kid given an SLR. And, um, and it, from that moment on, and I remember it vividly today, looking up in those mountains with a big grin on my face saying, that's where I want to be. And I remember my NCOs just slapping my head and saying, you know, you're still wet behind the ears. You've got a lot to learn yet. Well, I did two tours to Dofar um, with the RAF regiment. And um, I was 19 on my second tour. And I applied for the regiment then. And I just passed my 20th birthday when I turned up in the January in the mid 1970s to do SAS selection. Um, back in those days, it was uh, about 125 to a course. My course was smaller. It was just under 100. I think it was about 97, 98, um, simply because of what the Brits were doing around the world at that time. It wasn't that the units weren't willing to release their lads to go on selection. It was that the lads weren't getting time to do their own personal training before attending selection. So it was a smaller course by probably about 30 students. And at the end of it, um, five of us and an officer, a great officer, um, passed. And I think they saw me as a blank canvas and, and thought, wow, this, this lad, he's keen, he's very fit, he's reasonably bright. We can take him and mold him into one of our own, you know? Because I can't think for the life of me any other reason why, why they passed me. <laughs> But it was a blast, and I ended up going back out to Dofar um, with uh, one of the last SAS trips before the Dofar War ended in 1976. So, uh, so it was it was a great start, and I got my my wish. Looking up in the mountains, watching them in that firefight, I was then stood in those mountains, looking back down at the hedgehogs, Salala Airfield, Salala Town, and the and the coastline as an SAS soldier. So I got my wish and it was uh, probably the biggest moment in my military career. Somebody asked me not so long ago, actually, what, what would you describe as your biggest moment? And that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Something as simple as that, but it meant the world to me. Yeah. Yes, it's funny, isn't it? What us, I don't even know what kind of type, I'm hearing this word Da Vinci types a lot recently, the people that sort of like just want to get out there and, and, and you know, they're thinkers and they, they don't really fit in a box and they get a lot of stuff done in life. But I, I won't pretend I know a lot, of, a lot about that, but it's, you know, I dived off the cliff in Acapulco, right? Not from the top. I'm not, not I'm not stupid. I'm, I'm, I'm neither that, that skilled or, or um, stupid, but, and it was because I saw Elvis do it in one of those films they played when he died and all summer they played Elvis films and one of them was Elvis in Acapulco. And he ended up being a big hero and diving off this infamous clip or this very famous clip. And as an adult, when I went, uh, I was backpacking around the world and I landed in Mexico spent a couple of nights in Mexico City and then I went straight out Bob to Acapulco I wanted to see this you know just something that most people would just not be interested in was so important to me and when I got there I said to the, the girl I was traveling with I said look there's the changing room for the cliff divers Las Clavid Las Clavadistas right so I'm, I'm gonna go go and have a look right I was so excited and I went went in this changing room and there's all these these weights that they've got for warming up and very humble, very humble. I mean, this is Mexico and it, it hadn't 20 years ago or 15, whenever it was, it, it hadn't come on an awful lot. And next thing I know, this guy walks in mop with a mop. Hola, hola. Um, got talking and I said, do you know any of the cliff divers? And he went, see. Sí. You know, he was, you know, he was a cliff diver, basically. And um, 
and he and uh, he said, uh, "Vamos nadar." He said, "Do you want to go for a swim?" So I thought he meant because it's in like a hotel. There's a hotel on this cliff top. I thought he meant, you know, let's go to the hotel swimming pool and have a dip. So I'm like, "Yeah, definitely." He peels his shirt off and starts heading down to the lagoon, the famous lagoon and when the, the swell was just huge i mean there was a like a 10 foot 10 foot swell going up and down these cliffs and he just dived in <laughs> well next thing i'm diving into the famous lagoon with one of the Me acapulco and mexican cliff divers <laughs> and uh, we're swimming it was swimming in the surf and uh, i just swam over to the cliff when the, when the waves went, when the swell went up, I grabbed hold of a rock and then the swell sort of dropped and I I clung to this rock and I started climbing up. And this guy, I think he was called Salvador or something, he's, he's like, no, 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 down, get down, get them. I'm like, no, no, I'm going up. And I climbed, I climbed, um, ah, I wouldn't even say, I wouldn't even say it's halfway, Bob, but I climbed a third of the way, turned and I dived. Great stuff. A lit, something small like that. No. I, I'm so happy. I'm just so happy I've lived my life that way. Yeah, it, it doesn't take much to 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 make people happy. You know, it's uh, you know that that was a moment in my career that will live with me forever. You know, and it's as clear today as it was on the day. You know, and it, it's funny. You know, I, I was just I was talking to somebody the other day over a brew and. It's, next year is 50 years to my first war as a 17-year-old. Now, if you relate that to when I was on that first war as a 17-year-old, 50 years before that was 1922, you know? And, you know, that's a handful of years after um, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, was wandering around the empty quarter on the back of a camel doing amazing things, you know? Um, so you know, a 50 year increment goes very, very quickly in someone's life. And, uh, you know, that became really apparent when we were having that brew the other day and I was trying to relate the story about the first war, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so any younger people watching this, you know, 50 years goes quickly, so enjoy your life. <laughs> don't, don't be down. <laughs> Bob, I think a lot of people would be fascinated. You joined the, the special air service from the RAF. Um, yeah, there, there was two people before me. Um, well, actually, there was three people before me. There was an officer who became a troop commander um, in B Squadron. And there was uh, the other two were junior NCOs. They were corporals in the RAF regiment. And I was a, a Tom. I didn't have a rank. I just turned 20. And uh, so I was the first... Tom, if you like, to, from the RAF regiment. And then uh, after me, there's been, been a, a, good, a good few since. And I think from, especially from two squadron, the, the parachute squadron, it's a tiny unit. And I've got a picture, actually, <laughs> look at this. Um, I don't know if you can see that. That's three of us from two squadron um, out on the ground. Just a bit up. You see it? Yes, what an incredible picture. Yeah, it's out there on the internet. That's three of us from two squadron um, in 22 SAS meeting in the Wadi in Iraq to do all, all the admin and fix the vehicles and get bombed up and everything before we went back out again on the ground. And uh, that's a great photo because two squadron is a tiny, tiny unit. And to have three guys in the regiment all at the same time is quite something, you know? Wow. So it's a photo that I personally treasure, you know. I only did three years in the, in the RAF regiment and, you know, almost 20 years in the SAS, 23 years altogether. But those three years got me through selection, basically. You know, those great young lads that, who were older than me, um, that had the better skills than me, uh, the NCOs and the officers, they made sure that I was going to pass selection and that I wasn't going to come back to two squadron. Maybe they had a reason for that. They're <laughs> trying to get rid of me. But um, but I owe I owe all of them a debt of gratitude um, because they prepared me well, you know, and uh, they they um, 
they were very realistic about what I needed to do and uh, how I needed to behave and, you know, be the grey man and all the rest of it. Well, you be, be the grey man at times, but there are times that uh, if you're too much of the grey man, you're not going to pass at all because nobody knows who you are. He was on selection. I don't remember him. <laughs> so, you know, you have to come out of your shell at the right times, you know. I'm guessing you have to be quite respectful to the DS on selection. You, you can't come across... I, that, 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 that's a, a great comment because being on selection is no different to being on any other course, whether it be in the Royal Marines, in the Paris, the School of Infantry, a core course. You know, it's, there's a human nature element within that course and the interaction between the student and the instructor. If one doesn't like the other, something bad is going to come out of it. And it's a human nature thing, and you cannot take that away. And I know individuals that probably didn't get through selection because they weren't going to put up with what was going on, you know? And it was probably the regiment's loss, not their loss. And their unit, of which the individual would go back to, it was there again because they didn't lose that individual. So there's, you know, in reality, there's human elements everywhere, you know, um, and it's not 100% crystal clear because of the human element. So, you know, the SAS is no different to any other unit. You know, I, I keep getting this thing about, you know, special forces and I get little comments on my... Uh, on my blog or on my Facebook, the, the author's page, um, Bob Shepherd author, about, you know, you're a legend and all the, I'm, I'm no legend, I'm no legend. You know, legends have just been playing in the Six Nations rugby, you know, they're legends. Young kids want to emulate these amazing rugby players that have quite a short career today. They're legends. I'm not a legend. None of my mates are legends. We're just ex-soldiers like, yourself and all the other ex-soldiers, no matter the cap badge, no matter the colour of the berry, because we're all needed in war. Without one, the war doesn't go ahead. You know, and, uh, you know we, there's attached ranks at Hereford, way more in numbers than there are you know, men in the SAS. Now, you take those attached ranks away, the SAS is going nowhere. And that's the same with the SBS with its marine navy structure around it. We're going nowhere and we all need each other. So I take pride in serving alongside a signals lad as much as I take pride in serving alongside, you know, my mate who's a trooper, you know, because we all need each other. And that's really, really important. And anybody from a special forces unit that thinks otherwise, it's pie in the sky. The guy's not living. They wouldn't, in my humble experience, special forces guys just not like that, are they? They're all, they're, they're, there's a very... The, the vast majority are, you know, fairly, fairly quiet, kind of feet on the ground type people. Mm. We have to be. Now, you imagine, you know, I, I was a troop staff sergeant of a boat troop in G Squadron. And... Uh, I was one of the smallest guys in the troop and I'm having to keep, you know, some of these big gorillas in order and they're all tough characters, mentally and physically, some more mentally, some more physically. And you have to be a special person to be in a small group of men and not only command them, but, but be one of them as well. And, you know, we have, the, the, the chunter where we get together over brew and decide how we're going to do things. But ultimately, the troop commander and myself as the troop staff sergeant, you know, we're the ones that say, OK, this is what we're doing now. We've listened to everybody's comments. This is what we've decided and we're going to get on with it. And, um, you know, you do have to you have to have your feet on the ground to be able to do that and to do it well and to bring everybody along especially when times are tough, you know, the, you know, the, the Falklands War, for example, the, 
SAS was given tasks that were outrageous with, with nothing, not even a proper map, nothing, you know? And, um, you know, I, I parachuted down there as part of an eight-man team to do a build-up within a war zone. We eventually met up with a, an old O-class submarine, HMS Onings, mm -hmm. and we dispersed onto uh, islands around the major islands. Some were inhabited by Argentinians, some weren't, just to get our drills squared away because we were going to the mainland to take out the Super Eton guards that were sinking our ships. Now, this was a knee-jerk reaction. Can you explain for our friends at home what, what that terminology is, Bob? The, the, is that a missile or is that an aeroplane? Yeah, it's an aeroplane that was launching the missile. It's a French aeroplane and uh, a French fighter aircraft that was launching the missiles that were um, sinking our ships. And, you know, the, 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 the war at the time was on a knife edge. It could go either way because of the sinking of the ships. There's no cavalry coming over the hill. They sent um, ships down to resupply. And one of the bigger ships that had helicopters and Harriers on it to replace the ones that were lost sank because that was hit, the Atlantic conveyor. Mm. Um, so the eight of us were going to leave the submarine, go on the coast of Argentina and attempt to take out these aircraft. Now, that was a huge mission, a huge mission for eight guys. And we were supplemented by two fantastic SBS coxswains, both who I know well, their mates, and uh, because they had to return the boats back to the submarine, because had we hid them and they were found, we were compromised. And had we slashed them and sunk them, they'd have been washed ashore. So they had to be returned to the submarine. So it was a joint operation. And to cut a long story short, on our way in, having done all this build-up training, and uh, we did some operations with D Squadron um, as part of the war, um, on the way in, the Argentinians and the Falklands surrender. Mm. So they obviously heard we were coming. <laughs> um, and, and of course, it was all on the say-so of Thatcher. Thatcher gave the word, obviously going on the people around her, that the operation should go ahead. And then when the Argentinians surrendered, she gave the word that that submarine's got to pull straight back again. And that was the end of the war, basically. So it was a little bit like, you know, we're all in the aircraft ready to parachute. And then the wings on the ground pick up and the, para the parachuting's off. Well, all that buildup of adrenaline is still in you. So there we are in the submarine. The submariners are all cheering and hugging each other because the war's over. And we're all gutted because we didn't get our part to play on the mainland. Well, years later, I find out that the Argentinians had 3,000 Marines around the area of the Super Eton Dards all the way out to the coastline. So how far the eight of us would have got, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. But I would like to have had the chance to have tried, I must admit, you know. And, and what I will say is, you know, everybody's read about the more recent Bravo 2-0 and, uh, you know, one of the more infamous operations that's out there in the public domain. But the eight of us were absolutely up for that operation. It was headed up by a great troop sergeant and, uh, and we all worked as one. And we couldn't wait to get off that submarine, get in the small boats with the SBS lads, get on the ground and do it. And, uh, and, and it was with limited kit, because that's what we're about. We don't say, well, we haven't got this, we haven't got that, we can't do it. We just get what we've got and we run with it and we make it work because that's our job. And that's what's in our heads, you know? And I think, you know, People call us special forces. We're not special. We're called the Special Air Service and the Special Boat Service. When I joined the Special Air Service, it was the Special Boat Section 
Then it became the Special Boat Squadron. And then it became the Special Boat Service. All the same guys, great guys, just different names, you know? Makes, it doesn't make any odds. It's all the same guys. None of them are special. None of us were special. And being a boat troop guy, I worked a lot with the SPS. We're all the same. We wear a different cap badge. We've got the same role, the same job. We get on with it. We're two tiny units. Most operationally, we're normally combined anyway, because there's not enough of us to go around. One lot is from the Navy slash Royal Marines. The other lot's from the Army. That's back in my day. It's all different, as you know now, because it's a combined selection, which in my view, should have happened decades ago. I spent a year down at Poe, and uh, I was a staff sergeant at the time, and I had an absolute ball. The SBS lads welcomed me with open arms. And, uh, and one of the things I tried to do, but failed, was bring the two units together and suggest a combined selection. Because what was going on was, it was two completely different types of selection. So there was a mindset between the two that was slightly different. And an SBS lad, if he was rank conscious, could pass the SBS selection, go into the SBS, stay two years, go back into the Marine system, get his Lance Corporal, get his Corporal, get his Sergeant, and then go back into the SBS. And all the SBS lads that remained there might be Corporals. And he's jumped them and come back in. In the SAS, the time, this is when I was in, the time you decide that you want to leave the, S, the SAS, you lose all your rank. And if you come back, you do selection again and you start again at Trooper. And I believe that that was right for both units. That was the way to be. A, it makes people think twice about leaving. And B, we're all on the same page, you know? So, so that was going on. And uh, a quick story about my time down in the SBS. Great rivalry. Of course, I'm the minimum number one. I'm, I'm on my own. So I'm having to take all this crap from the SBS lads every morning. You guys do fizz in the morning before breakfast. That killed me. I cannot do fizz before breakfast. That's not an army thing. We need a big fat English breakfast in us before we do anything. So I'm getting up in the morning, meeting up with my SPS buddies and getting the pants run off me and then back again, or we're going swimming or we're doing some, you know, gym work or, or whatever it is. But, you know, everybody gets their chance. So one morning it was my turn. And I, you know, I, I kept it simple. We went for a, like a six mile run. We came back and uh, warming up exercises to begin with, warming down exercises. This wasn't long after the Falklands and I had the Marines, uh, the SPS lads bending down, touching their toes, coming up slowly, coming up, coming up and standing like that. So I had a half circle of Marines around me, all with their hands up and I just turned around and walked away. And then they chased me all over pool. Anyway, <laughs> it was all a laugh and a joke. We had a couple of beers that night. We're all giggling about it. And then a couple of months later, um, this SBS lad says, oh, Bob, uh, do you fancy going for a run tonight after work? I'm like, yeah, that'd be great, mate. And he was a really good runner. And uh, so he meets me outside the sergeant's mess, which is where I was staying. And we go running out of, uh, you know, Hamworthy and out into the cuds and, and, I, and I'm looking at my watch and, and we're doing about seven minute miling pace up and down. And uh, I'm just hanging on to him. And then we turn up at this house and he stops at the gate. And I'm like, what are you doing, mate? And we're 10 miles away. And he goes, uh, I live here. See ya. <laughs> so that was payback for my uh, <laughs> stretching exercises. <laughs> So fantastic stuff, you know, and I had an absolute ball down there. I learned so much and uh, I actually came back and I had a vision that there shouldn't be a, there should only be a boat troop in Hereford 
to move the other troops ashore or to do light reccees and stuff like that. We shouldn't be at the extent of what, or we shouldn't be trying to do what the SPS are doing because they're streaks ahead. That's their job. That's their bread and butter. They're O2, they're oxygen diving. And for those that don't know, that's diving subsurface where you're not popping bubbles up to the surface. It's a rebreathing unit and there are no bubbles at all. It's, uh, so, you know, you can swim in, nobody from the surface can see you. We shouldn't be doing that. That takes a lot of effort. The SPS are on the coastline. If they want to spend three hours doing that, they're there, they can do it. We live in Hereford. We're landlocked. It's like a landlocked county, you know? It's crazy that we, we just don't have time to do this stuff, you know? And uh, so we're forever chasing the error. And, uh, you know, I just felt that the powers to be, the lads are all the same. You know, we had SBS lads coming up to us for anti-terrorist stuff, and we were all working together. We were all gelling. We would go down to pool. We'd, we'd do the same with them. We would gel. But it was a hierarchy. Those in charge of the Navy and the Royal Marines, those in charge of the Army and uh, HQ Special Forces, they're the ones that are trying to, to write their own history, you know? The lads just want to get on with the job. We're all the same. I don't give a damn if we combined, you know, we all wore a green berry with a wing dagger or, you know, or, a, a, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. We're all the same. We've all got a job to do. We need to do it to the best of our ability. And we're not doing that when the headsheds are having a pissing match against each other. And this came out in the Falklands War, you know? You had the head of the Navy wanting to do this because he's writing his legacy. The head of the Army doing the same thing. The head of the Royal Marines doing the same thing. Oh, we need these islands taken out. I want to use the SPS but they're on a mission, the SES are ready, or the other way around, you know? You know, just, just get it together, fellas. We're all the same machine. We're fighting the Argentinians. Why are we fighting each other? So, you know, this is the kind of stuff that goes up, or that goes on, the echelons above your pay run, you know? You don't know about it at the time. You find out about it later when you start asking questions. Why are we doing this? You know, this, this is just ludicrous. There's a better way. Well, there's not a better way because it's not your guy in charge. It's somebody else's guy at this moment in time. And uh, it's childishness. And senior officers need to be bigger than that. And the sad thing is they have blood on their hands. You know, British blood, not Argentinian blood, British blood. And that happened time and time again. It happened in the first Gulf War. I worked with the media as a security advisor embedded with US troops. I've watched it happen with them. I watched it with British troops in Helmand, where they were sent down there to win the hearts and minds of the people. And just very quickly, uh, the lies that goes on, you know, we're in Afghanistan to keep the streets of Britain safe, say the politicians and the generals. And they're still saying that 20 years later, when we lost 20 years ago, and we lost 20 years ago because we went in on the back of American foreign policy and we took one side of a 30 year simmering civil war, which sometimes, you know, was an all out bloody civil war. And then it would go quiet again and it would simmer. So we took one side of that civil war. We took the Northern tribes side. And then in 2005, the generals get together under the American general. And the American general says, I would like you British to go down to Helmand. So in 2006, they go down to Helmand and they try to win the hearts and minds of the people who are on the other side of the civil war, the Southern tribes, the Pashtun people, an absolute no brainer. And I, I went down there as part of a small media team. We drove from Kabul and we drove all the way down to Southern Helmand to meet with the Taliban on the banks of the river. And they said to us, if anybody comes here in a foreign uniform, there will be blood. And boy, were they right. Mm. And I came back and I met a senior officer who I knew from my army days in HQ in Kabul. 
and I was virtually thrown out for telling the truth. And, yeah. you know, it's all water under the bridge now. But this is the kind of stuff that goes on. People trying to write their own legacies, you know, one general handing over to the next, handing over to the next, handing over to the next, lying, lying, lying. When they've got their chessboard, but they can't have all the pieces on that chessboard because you've got fantastic infantry troops from New Zealand who politically are not allowed to be deployed to the hard areas. So they're up in Bamyan lording it when they're needed down in Kandahar and Helmand and Paktika, Paktia on the, the Pakistan border and other provinces. So, you know, the, the generals aren't loaded fully, you know? It's all politics and modern day generals, I've found in the last 20 years of the wars are wearing their political hat instead of wearing their military hat. And they need to take that political hat off and put that military hat back on and support their men and women under them, you know? So, you know, I've seen an awful lot out of the military and it reminded me of the stuff that I saw in the military. Lions led by donkeys, you know? It's, it hasn't changed since the 1800s, you know? Mm. Um, but, but we'll do our job. And, you know, sitting here as a 66-year-old, it doesn't matter whether I was an infantryman or I was in the SAS or otherwise, we have the same mindset in war, and that's to look after each other to our left and right. To hell with the politics. We can't get involved in that. If we got involved in that, we'd probably take our uniform off and walk away. And so would the enemy if they knew their politics, you know? But we don't do that. We get on with it. And... Yeah. Uh, you know, if I had my life, you know, knowing what I know today as an older person, if I had my life over again, I would do exactly the same again. Mm -hmm. The military gave me a fantastic life and it gave me, it gave me something I didn't have when I ran away from home. It gave me love. It gave me a family. I never had that until I joined the military, you know, um, the love of a human being. Um, the, the cohesion of a family, you know, and, and just like you, I'm sure, I'm still in touch with mates that I served with as a 17-year-old on Facebook and all the rest of it, you know. It's fantastic. Mm. There's nothing like it. Well, mine, um, they all still owe me money, Bob. Say again? Sorry. I'm in touch with mine because they all still owe me money. Yeah, there you go. Well, I owe them money. That's why they're in touch with me. <laughs> oh, I'm uh, hoping to get my all those checkbooks back one day. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a fantastic life. I, um, you know, it gets politicised. Um, there are things wrong. There's no doubt about it. Um, a lot of stuff that is wrong and has been wrong over the decades does mainly lie at the top end and not the bottom end. And uh, I don't think that'll ever change. Not when, certainly on the British system, where senior officers get more and more letters after their name, more and more medals, knighthoods, whether they're successful or whether they're dismal failures, you know? And if you look at the wars of the last 20 years and you look at the letters after the generals' names today, how on earth have they got those letters? They're dismal failures, you know? The lads and the lasses aren't failures. All they're doing is going on the ground and fighting to the best of their ability. And when you look at the British troops down in Helmand, there isn't another nation that could have fought as well as those British troops. But they were all, pardon the expression, fucked by their own leadership, you know? And that is appalling. Yeah. You know, when we learn lessons from history, and the officer corps at officer school are put, in, you know, this is put into them, you know? They read history. They're, they're, they, you know, there's professors from universities come and give them military history lectures. Mm. Yet it all goes in one ear and out the other for the chase of, you know, medals and titles and everything else and trying to leave a legacy. And most, most of them recently have led it, you know, left a pretty bad, Legacy, you know, but 
but but there you go. You know that's uh, that's the way it is. It just has to get better in the future. And I think the little people like ourselves need a voice. And your podcast is a a great platform for that because we can have a voice today. Years ago we couldn't because we didn't have social media. Yeah, so I think we should also give a shout out that you know when you're young, you're in the military, you're just you you just do your job. To be honest, you don't really know a lot more. But we should recognise those people that off the back of their military career then go on to do great things with respect to our freedom. They use their experience, they they make sense of it, they understand why they did what they did and who was telling them to do it. And I'm thinking of people like Mike McCarthy, who we've had on the show, I think three times now. Um, just a massive warrior for justice and freedom. Um, no, that's, uh, that's all fantastic. And, and most certainly, not so much in the UK, and I don't know why, but most certainly over here in the States, there are an awful lot of officers that served in Iraq and Afghanistan who have turned their hand to politics and they're doing incredibly well. And they're, they most certainly have a voice and they are changing things slowly. Um, but we need more of that back home, in my view. I mean, I'll be coming home sometime soon. I won't be living in America forever. Um, I haven't taken on American status and I have no intention. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just want to go home. My home is the UK. And I'm not one of these people that sit with multi passports, passports of convenience. I think if you take on somebody else's passport, you should hand your own one in, you know? I mean, I can't be British and American. I'm British and I'll never be anything else. I'm proud, you know? And my home is the UK and that's where I want to die, you know? I don't want to die in America. Um, so I'll be going home one day. Yes. Back to Bonnie, Scotland, no doubt. Yeah, probably closer to Hereford because that's where my adult children and grandchildren are around that area. So, uh, you know, we, I, I lived in Malvern before I came over here. Uh, it's a, a ridge line of hills running north-south about 10 miles, and it's stunning. You stand on that ridge line, you look east, you see the Cotswolds, you look west, you see the Welsh mountains, it's just absolutely stunning. And there's nothing like throwing a pack on and going for a run over the Malvern Hills. Uh, and, and I loved it there. And we came over here because my wife's American, she's a journalist, and she was appointed a post to, to work from Manhattan. And here we are. So it's a great chapter in our lives. I love America. I love the American people. There's things wrong with it, as I said earlier. There's things wrong in the UK too. But there are people in place that are trying to fix it. So that's great, you know, but the people are wonderful and they love a chat. They love an accent, you know, so, uh, so it's fun. How many times have you been asked if you're Australian? Yeah, more often than not. It's either Australian or those that are closer. Are you Irish? Especially around here, because it's all Irish and Italians. You're slightly, uh, with the Scottish accent, yeah, the Albanians are stepping in now and uh, the Italians are getting a bit shaky because, uh, you know, I know where I live, there's five or six Albanian families and the kids go to the local school. So they're taking over, <laughs> taking over from the Italians and the, and the Irish. Bob, you, you, you were a bit humble there you, when you said you parachuted into Falklands. You, you parachuted into the sea in the Falklands. Yeah, I... Um, yeah, what, what happened was uh, we, we jumped basically into, into the sea uh, to be met by HMS Andromeda, a frigate. And then we were cross-decked about three or four times and we were co-located with D Squadron, who had sadly, along with G Squadron, lost a number of guys in that uh, infamous helicopter accident of the Sea King. And... Uh, and we did some operations with them. Then we, the, the submarine came and met up with us. And we did some landings with the SBS lads and tried to cut down on our timings 
of assembling the boat, floating off the submarine, floating back on. And uh, I remember we were on an island once that we were told may have Argentinians, and we were lying on the beach, legs across each other for contact, communication, just waiting for the submarine to come back to us so we could get in the boats, and, and, and or sorry, be met by the SPS lads, get in the boats and go back to the submarine. And then all of a sudden, I get a kick on my leg from the guy to my right, who's had a kick on his leg from the guy to his right. And it was the number system of enemy coming along the beach. Um, there's eight of us lying on the beach, spread out, cross-legged. And I remember the kicks getting into the 20s. I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, we're, we're going to be ambushing a force way way larger than ourselves. And then uh, you could see the silhouettes of this army coming down the beach. And, you know, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. I could feel my heart thumping against the gravel on the beach. And, uh, you know, I was in a dry bag. And, um, and then somebody whispers off to my right, and the wind was coming from the right. What the fuck is that smell? And then all of a sudden somebody starts laughing and it was penguins, it wasn't Argentinians, it was penguins. And they're all waddling down the beach, you know? <laughs> but given that, it, it, you know, the, the, there was a bit of a moon, but it was cloudy, so the moon's coming out, it's going back in again. There's different light conditions. And all you could see was the silhouette of movement. and it was Argentinians first, penguins second. <laughs> so when you jumped into the sea, um, two things. First, can you just tell us what what what's it like? What I mean, what aircraft were you jumping from? What equipment did you have, and how does it feel? But also, you you were with Robin, weren't you? No, no, no. The B squadron jumped in. I think it was the day after the surrender. And, you know, they, they, nobody knew how, war, how long the war was going to last. So it was a matter of getting another squadron down there to take over from the squadron that was down there from the beginning and then get them out and, and start, you know, rotating people. And um, so poor old B squadron jumped in at the end of the war. Well, we were B squadron, but we jumped in um, because of this special mission to do on the mainland. Now, we already had eight lads in a disaster of an operation in the mainland that ended up going on the run in Chile. And, you know, that's all out there. Books have been, you know, written about it and uh, historians have mentioned it, um, where the... Uh, the, the, the helicopter that was taking the lads in to do that initial operation, um, the helicopter was getting locked onto. So it kind of sided across the border into Chile, landed. The crew burnt the helicopter out. The lads went on the run to a, a safe RV, got picked up and, and back, to, back to the UK. Um, so we came in as a second wave to do it from a submarine and not from a helicopter because it was deemed more covert and the submarine was down there then. It hadn't been down there before. So, uh, and this is the small O-class diesel submarine, um, HMS Onyx. So we jumped into the sea. We actually had pallets delivered off the tailgate, the C-130, and we followed those pallets out. The pallets didn't open, they creamed in. So we lost all our kit. So we were beg, stealing and borrowing off everybody, off D squadron, G squadron, the SPS, the Royal Marines, the Navy. I was walking around looking like a sailor with the, um, what's the, you know, they give you a box, don't they? If you're, uh, if you've been, swim, you know, your, your ship sunk and you're swimming, Survi survivor's box. So I was dressed like a, a Navy lad, you know? Yeah. Um, for the rest of the war. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember at the end of the war, because it wasn't known if the Argentinians would have a, a second crack at it, 
the eight of us stayed behind. And it's the worst thing that could happen to us because a garrison was forming now. It's post-war, you know? And we were getting stopped by military police. We had long hair, beards, well, the kind of beard I could grow in my 20s, um, dressed as a matlow with, a, with an AR-15 and a magazine on it. And they're like, uh, Get, take your magazine off. And we're like, no, take your magazine off. You know, you're in a garrison. And, uh, you know, we, we, we had to get our patrol commander to, to go and liaise with the RSM who was in charge of the garrison and say, look, please, mate, just leave us alone. You know, we live in a guest house. We're well away from everybody else. We're doing our own build-up training and um, just leave us, which they did, to be fair, you know. Mm. And we stayed there for a number of weeks. It was dreadful, you know. And we just wanted to get back and get on with life and uh, fit back into the squadron, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so... Uh, so that was the Falklands. And uh, before that, two years before that, we had the Iranian embassy. And the Iranian embassy was, uh, I, I was on the top floor going in from the roof. I didn't see an angry charwaller. I could have stayed in Hereford. But it's all part of being the team, you know? Sometimes chicken, sometimes feathers. So I was spitting feathers. But I had the job of uh, lowering the explosive above the stairwell you know, the big glass dome above the stairwell. Mm. And that was basically the distraction explosion. So if anybody watches the Iranian embassy, little BBC clip on YouTube, um, there's a big explosion. And then there's some uh, journalists going, that was a bomb, that was a bomb. And then you then see the lads climbing out, you know, the, the, the four lads of the 30,000 that climb out onto the, the front balcony that everybody's seen. So I set that first explosion off. Well, actually, I put it in position. I didn't set it off. My buddy at the end with the clacker set it off. And my big worry, lowering it down, because I had to lower it down about eight foot onto the, the glass stairwell, lowering it down, um, it, it was just, it, it was all basic kit. It was plastic explosive at the end of deck cord, that's all it was. And I'm lowering the deck cord down, thinking if somebody com gets compromised at a window um, and they call go, 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 instead of the natural standby, standby go, my mate in the heat of the moment just might let the clacker go and I'm blown to pieces, you know? And I remember I'm thinking this, and at the same time out the corner of my eye, I'm looking across at the block of apartments opposite us and I'm watching this old biddy and her husband making a cup of tea in the kitchen. You know, great big Georgian windows in these buildings, like the Iranian embassy. You know? and, uh, and I'm thinking, I hope they're not going to burn themselves when I set this explosive off, you know? <laughs> and I'm more, more concerned about them than I am about myself, you know? Two lovely old biddies just making a cup of tea, you know, in the evening. <laughs> And then off it all goes, you know. So that was my wee job. And, you know, as I say, we're all small wheels in a, in a big well-oiled machine. Or well, we hope it's well-oiled. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it's all out there, you know. But it wasn't, it wasn't the big heroic operation that it's made out to be. We trained every day for that. And the whole scenario went according to it the training scenarios that we undertake. And the anti-terrorist team had only been going about five years at that point, and uh, properly, at, at, at like squadron level. So it was very new. The kit was pretty raw and rugged. There was nothing that was really classed as specialist. All the, uh, you know, the window frame explosives were all hodgepodge made by ourselves with raw explosives that the military, any military would get, you know? It's only much later, post the success of the Iranian embassy, that the government threw money at the regiment to say, get what you need, basically, you know? And of course, most of the kit that we started getting was from the United States. And at that time, Delta Force was pretty new. Delta Force was based on ourselves 
And I remember when I first joined the regiment, um, the, the guy who, who invented Delta Force, um, a great guy called uh, Colonel Charlie Beckwith, had fought in Vietnam and stuff, and he'd actually watched the regiment in Malaya during the campaign. Um, so he came to Hereford and he just watched us all and wrote it all down, went back to America, formed Delta Force in squadrons and troops, just like 2-2 SAS. And uh, so we, we, we came together in a lot of, of training. And of course, only days before the SAS uh, operation at the Iranian embassy in London, Delta Force had a dreadful scenario in Iran, in the desert of Iran called Desert One, where they had a huge failure of all their acts and debts colliding in the desert with helicopters and, uh, and, and C-130 aircraft. So they had to pull their mission. So we got all the plaudits worldwide. Oh, the SAS are better than Delta Force. Look what they did. Yeah, but, you know, we were playing at home, you know? We were in London. They were in the deserts of Iran, about to go to Tehran to release their own hostages, you know? So, you know, let's be fair here, you know? Gosh, yes. It, I guess it must be... Um... Must be nice to at least, I mean, you were involved. You were, it's the most talked about operation in British military history since the Second World War, isn't it? The thing that happened, the worst thing that happened is that Margaret Thatcher and her advisors or her advisors wanted to make an overt operation to tell the world, don't come to this country, or this is what's going to happen to you. And the media coverage of the operation is the worst thing that ever happened to the regiment. It blew it out the water. It, everybody wanted to know about the SAS after that. We had media crawling all over Hereford, you know, young pretty girls in the bars trying to latch on to lads to find out information, all sorts going on, you know. And uh, it's the worst thing that ever happened. Before that, you know, we could walk downtown from camp in our uniform, go to the bank, do a bit of admin, come back, back to work, you know. After that, we're having to go to work in civilian clothes, you know, be careful. I had to send my wife out to check the car every morning. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, so we had to be careful after that. And uh, you know, not only was the, uh, the, the IRA threat, there was threat from world terrorism as well, you know. Um, but uh, it, was, it was a chapter in, in, in my military career. It was a good chapter. It was great to be able to do, um, but it wasn't the amazing thing that people make out. It was quite a simplified operation. And today, the lads, they do that, you know, they, they've been doing that, you know, three or four times a day in a 24-hour period in the Middle East, hitting targets, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to think that, you know, this old guy is a stepping stone to the professionalism of the guys today, you know, just like the guys before me that, you know, did the whole of Dofar, did the Radfan, did Borneo, did Malaya, you know, I learned from them. I went on to training wing, lads learned from me, then they moved on, etc. And I always see the SAS soldier, probably the SPS soldier as well, saying that we're similar, as a changing character every 12 to 15 years. It's a different breed. And I think that's a great thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. And that's one of the reasons why I chose to leave as a 40-year-old and not become a hanger-on, you know? Get out, have a whole new career, enjoy it, use my past skills and, and just get away. And I've never been back in camp from the day I left in 1994 when I cried my eyes out like a baby because that was the end of it, you know? Um, I wanted to stay in, but I knew I had to leave. You know, and uh, and sitting back now, I'm glad I did. I had a whole new venture, 
And I, I would probably argue I did more dangerous things as a security advisor working with the media alone than I ever did in the regiment where I've always got a buddy partner to, uh, to my left or right, you know? I mean, and, and making proactive calls where the drive down to meet the Taliban in Helmand in 04. You know, that was a huge issue. That was a great story for the company that, that got it, got the story. And it was a good coup for me. It was a fantastic adventure, you know? And uh, I used Afghan security guys from Kabul. And when we went into a different warlords area outside Kabul, we'd stop, we'd drop a couple of guys off, we'd pay for a couple of his guys, and then we move on to the next area, do the same all the way down. And then on the way back, it was the reverse, dropping other guys off, picking our own guys up and back to Kabul. It was a fantastic adventure, which I wrote about in the, in the circuit, the book, The Circuit. Mm. Um, and, and I enjoyed it. I got a lot out of it. And of course, I learned that we, we shouldn't be militarily in Afghanistan. <laughs> I learned that very early on. What, what were the Taliban like then for, for, for people that... You know, people have got to say, who are the Taliban? You know, they're, they're, there's different factions. You know, um, there's the hardcore Taliban that ruled the country uh, along with Mullah Omar, the likes of Mullah Omar. And, uh, and I remember meeting a guy who had been captured and interrogated by the CIA and then released back into um, uh, uh, Kabul, uh, who was the Pakistan ambassador of the Taliban. And every word that come out of that guy's mouth has proved to be true, you know? Um, you know, he's an open book and he sits in Kabul today and the media or some of the media that want to tell the real story will go and interview him. And I've got pictures of him on my website where, where we went to meet him and I've met him two or three times over the years. They were educated some of them very well, you know, university education. Brilliant, brilliant brain. Um, and they're hell-bent on getting back to Kabul. And they were very proud to say, we know that you have the watches, but we have the time. In other, in other words, we don't care if it takes generations. We'll just keep chipping away. You stay here, we'll chip away at you. Eventually, you'll go just like the British have gone three times before and the Russians have gone. And there we are today. We've lost 4-0, you know, 4-0. When are we going to learn? You know. Well, you can tie in every other conflict with that. They're, they're, they're all... You've only got to learn your history to see that they're all instigated by sociopaths. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I started off talking about T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. If the powers to be had listened to that man who was a subaltern, you know, um, that man was streaks ahead of the generals and the uh, political officers and all the other people that were, you know, movers and shakers of the new Middle East. And then much later in the 1920s, the Sykes-Picot agreement between the British and the French, carving up the greater Middle East by just drawing lines in the sands and splitting tribes and really not giving a damn as long as they get what they want out of it. And here we are today, the people that try to live there are still suffering from that agreement and you know, still suffering from our wars, you know? And uh, there's a lot to be learned. And, I, I like the fact that there are younger people than me who took part in the more recent wars that get it and they've become a voice and they're not shy of voicing their opinion and hats off to them. You know, I was just an older guy, a civilian walking down the middle part of the road with journalists looking at what's going on, even though I did military embeds with the Americans, the Brits, the French, the Canadians, the Afghans, you know. Um, but it, 
It opened my eyes. That working with the media, they might be doing a three-minute story to air on TV next week, and it might take seven to ten days to get all the material to tell that story. Well, I'm listening and not asking my own questions. I'm getting seven to ten days worth, not the two to three minute story. And I'm seeing everything with my own eyes. And that story that's being told, remember, back in America, is for clicks. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it has to be told in a certain way. I call it news light because that's what it is. They're telling part of the story. They're not telling the whole story. And they're doing that because they want to keep an audience. They want to stay popular. Otherwise, people will turn off and watch the other channel, you know? So I'm, so I'm learning, or, uh, you know, when I was doing it, I was learning heaps. And that's why I, I wrote the book with my wife. I wanted to spill it all out on the table because I was getting angry. Make sense of it and tell the British taxpayer what their money is getting wasted on. You know, blood and treasure. Great young men and women in uniform thinking that they're doing the right thing. Well, they are by just looking after each other, you know. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I was just saying a couple of days ago, I, I was it, I think it was in a podcast, I can't, can't quite remember who I was saying it to, but um, two of the guests that have been on the podcast, uh, both elite forces, smuggled themselves into Afghanistan recently. They had to do the full shebang, you know, wear all the gear and black themselves, you know, darken themselves up. Uh, commonly referred to as doing blackface now, I believe. But um, they got in there with a camera and, and it's exactly what every person with half an ounce of intelligence said 20 years ago. Yeah, the, the, the stories keep getting regurgitated. I, I, I watch stories out here um, on not just Afghanistan, on Palestine, the Israel-Palestine issue. doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on, but it's the same stories today as I, you know, I was covering with the media 20 years ago during the Second Intifada, the conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians in 2001, 2002. That was bloody, you know? It's the same stories today because the international community doesn't care, you know? Nobody cares. So they're getting on with it decade after decade after decade. The Afghan people have had 50 years now of war, of conflict, 50 years. That's outrageous in the 21st century, anywhere on the planet. Yeah. and. You've only got to think of Bush, Bush's s smile, isn't it, you know? I, you know, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, we supposedly live in a democracy and we all have a voice. And if you don't like it, lobby your MP. When you lobby your MP, he or she is forced to bring it up in Parliament. That's their job. And I tell people in America, you know, oh, well, what can you do? They've got this great wording. What can you do? Well, you live in a democracy. You can do whatever you want, you know, but nobody, nobody's bothered. You know, they're keyboard warriors. They, you know, they'll, they'll write about it with their mates on Facebook, put the world to rights, but won't actually get out there and do anything about it. And until people start to do that, nothing's going to change. We're going to remain the little people and the odd few are going to get richer and richer and richer. I mean, look at what they want us to do now. They want us to sit indoors and press a button on our computers and the Amazon truck will show up with our food, with our blankets, mm -hmm. with you know, anything, anything. Don't go outside, stay in your house. Get bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. You can even send for your big farmer. You don't have to go out. You know, this is what they want you to do. They want the car. They want the car to drive. I, I, I just bought a new car not that long ago. And the guy spent all his time trying to tell me what the car can do for me. And I'm like, listen, mate, I'm old school. I want a car that I'm in charge of. I don't want a car that's in charge of me. And of course, Americans, for some reason, 
they come out of their driveway backwards onto the busy street, backwards. And, you know, I asked my neighbours, why do you come out backwards? Well, probably because we're too lazy, we come back home, we're tired, we just go in forward, so in the morning we have to come out backwards. I'm like, but that's crazy. I see accidents every day. And, of course, the mummy or daddy that's taking their little children to play school or to junior school, the kids are sat in the back of the car, so they're going to get whacked first, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's a mentality thing. If you can start the day by driving your car out of the driveway forwards, then perhaps the rest of your day is going to go just as well. You know? It's, it's a very different mentality. When I, when I have a, a British Special Forces guest on the podcast, when the camera's off, they very often just say, fucking load of shit Chris isn't it with reference to what's going on in the world even them even the 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 military career itself a bit like what you're saying Bob about this heroes and legends thing that's well the heroes the heroes and legends are either every individual that puts on a uniform or no individual you know I have a thing about special and I keep saying we're not special. I've said it in talks in the past. We've all come from another unit. So how are we special? All we are is, you know, we have a little bit more self-discipline and we have a little bit more, you know, self-determination than the other people on the course, which makes us stand out. And we pass the course. Nobody fails SAS selection. Nobody fails it. Mm. Only certain people pass it. You can go back to your unit and you can hold your head high that you even attempted it. But, you, but we, we've all come from a different cat badge. So how on earth are we special? You know, we're all just normal soldiers with those two distinctions that I've just mentioned. And the instructor, of which I was one at one point, will look at the student and will just think, would I be happy going on operations with this individual? If the, you know, if it's yes, you've passed. If it's no, you'll be told why and you, you can go back to your unit, you know? And it's not like the Navy SEALs where if you want to come off the course, you go in the middle and you ring the bell. I mean, for me, how degrading is that, you know? You, you, can, you can stay in bed in the morning. Everybody else is getting their bargains together on the truck and off to the Brecon Beacons. But when we all come back, you're gone. You're, you're back on the train and back to your unit. You've lost nothing. You've lost no respect, nothing. You probably learned a little bit because you've been with other lads. And, you know, you can take that back to your unit with you, you know. And, and as I've been doing military courses with other military units, um, I've always used that as an opportunity to pin people and try and get them to come on selection. And they're like, Bob, I'm happy being an infantryman. And I'm like, but you'd be ideal at Hereford. I don't care, I'm not interested. I want to be the best infantryman that I possibly can be in my unit. Hats off to those people, our loss, you know? So there, you know, there are hundreds of lads that could breeze selection they don't want to, you know? Yeah, it just seems like our guys look at the last 20 years and they just see it for the crock of shit it is, Bob, you know? Yeah, that, that, that's unfortunate that we have been under or adhering to American foreign policy. And the Americans are of the same way of thinking, you know? The lads that were out there have wised up and, and they've seen it with open eyes where, you know, they're not being dictated to by senior ranks. And, and, and they're like, my God, look what we've just been through. I don't want to see young lads and lasses going through that ever again. So they're, they, you know, they've got voice. They're just the same as us. They're no different, you know? And all the American embeds that I did, brilliant people, brilliant people, just put in positions that are impossible. I, I went to um, 
In 2006, I went to the scariest place I have ever been in my life. And that was the first media embed ever, TV media embed, with troops in Helmand province, the northeast of Afghanistan. And they were getting hammered. And they were in this tiny little FOB at the bottom of a valley where you could touch the mountains next to you. And eventually, I didn't have a crystal ball, but eventually when I left, I couldn't wait to leave. When I left, that FOB was overrun. Something like eight American soldiers were killed, 21 or 24 wounded, and they just pancaked the local village with a 2,000 pounder. Men, women, and children, you know? Um, horrendous situation to put soldiers in, good soldiers. Horrendous. And it's the first time I'd ever been into a position where the guy's eyes were out on stocks and they're screaming and shouting at each other and pulling each other because they were shit scared. So was I. Mm -hmm. And I was only in there for a short period of time doing a news story. I couldn't wait to get on the helicopter and get out of there. And there's now a film out about it, Cam Desh, those of you that might be interested. K-A-M, K-A-M, D-E-S-H, Cam Desh. And I take okay. my hat off to every individual that served there, um, but I don't take my hat off to the senior officers that put them there. No. Uh, and it's amazing, like the Brits surviving in Helmand for so long, it is amazing that the, those young men, and there was a few women as well, young men and women that served through Camdesh actually lasted as long as they did. I'm amazed, you know? Mm. Um, but yeah, dreadful, dreadful scenarios run by, you know, senior officers that, like I said earlier, too busy wearing their political hats and not wearing their military hats, mm. you know? Yes, sadly, I, I do, mate. Cowards led by so cowards led by sociopaths and it's it's no different to looking out the window at what's going on at the, it's all it's all the same agenda they look down at us and they laugh they laugh right. well they, you know you know yourself i mean you've got a point there i mean you know all, all, all these people that make their millions in wall street are sociopathic to be able to do it in the manner that they do it in the first place you know so Anyway, there you go. But, um, but, but you know, it, it's a life. I, I, had, I had a blast in the military. You know, they, this, has been a, this has turned into a bit of a doer interview, and that's my doing, putting out what I believe. Mm. But I, I had a blast in the military. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, it gave me a life, and it gave me mates for life. And, uh, you know, I just lost a mate the other day, a laddie called Jerry, and uh, my heart goes out to his family and all his close friends. And uh, it's like losing a member of your own family, you know, every single one of them. And of course, I'm at that time of life now where it's going to happen more and more, you know, and it hurts. Did you struggle at all, Bob, when you, when you left? I, I think... I, I, yeah, I, I, I've struggled. I think everybody struggles. Some might may not admit it. Um, I think it doesn't matter who you are. We are all breakable because we're human beings. And uh, you go through certain things. And if uh, I, I had 40 years in war zones, 40 years mm. from 1972 to 1994, okay? Uh, in and out of war zones. And if that doesn't affect you, you're not human. So yeah, I, th I think, as I say, we're all breakable. We've all got little chinks in our armor. And I think it's how, how we cope with it, you know? Yeah, well, well, can you give some tips then? Because we got, you know, we're in a veteran's suicide epidemic at the moment. It's only set to Oh, I know, I'm well aware of it. And it's huge over here. It's to 22 people on average a day, veterans. 22 yeah. people commit suicide over here. It's huge. But we're all, individually, we're all like snowflakes. We're all different, okay? You and I, mm. you know, we can talk the talk and we can have a great um, 
conversation, but I'm sure we're completely different people, even though we went through the same stuff. So people handle it in different ways. I think one of the worst things that happen is when the individual bottles it in, doesn't come out their shell, doesn't share it. You have got to share it. You've got to share it. And then you see that your mates are actually like-minded or some of your mates and you can help each other. And you can only help each other by looking forward. Don't find the bottle. Don't find the drugs. Don't find a rope. Find your trainers, get them back on, go for a wee run, stick your pack on, get out in the woods, get out in the hills, get out in the fresh air, enjoy life, enjoy the earth that we live on. It's a fantastic place, despite the fact that people are telling us otherwise. I live in New York. I've just had a little trip with my wife and, and, and my child up to uh, upstate New York in the wilderness. There's moose, there's bears, there's mountain lions, there's wolves, there's everything. And there's stunning, stunning scenery. And three, four days up there walking around, that's me for the rest of the year now. I'll do the same thing later in the year and keep, keep myself going. I love it. You know, I, I, I still run. I still tab run with the Bergen on, no more than 35 pounds. I look forward all the time. I rarely look back unless I'm just sitting down reliving great memories, you know? Um, and I think that's the way to go. But you've got to share it. If you don't share it, you're on a hide into nothing. That's my version. Got to share it with the right people as well, because, you know, let's be honest about the veterans community. It's a massively judgmental people in there. Yeah, I think, I think when, when you're having a bad time, you find out who your mates are. You know, yeah. you're real mates. And uh, I find that out. I know dozens of mates that have done the same thing. They find that out as well. And stick by your real mates. And, uh, you know, everybody else will come around you eventually, you know. Yes. But, um, but I think, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I always look myself in the mirror and uh, I hate what I see. <laughs> but, um, and I ask myself, questions all the time I question myself you know mm. and uh, I used to do that in the military I used to question myself all the time remember it doesn't matter if you're a four-man SES patrol or a 31-man platoon there is a weak link in there is it you I, I used to ask myself that all the time am I the weak link troop staff sergeant am I the weak link the SMI of the jungle school wo one am I the weak link mm. you know Bob, listen, I, I, I can't wait to ask you about the jungle, but I'd like to do that in another podcast. Yeah, no worries. So I think we've uh, we stretched this one out. <laughs> the thing is with podcasts, if they're too long, then people go, oh, I'll watch that later. And then, of course, the later never happens and they miss your story. And Aye. so let's keep it there. No worries. Enjoy. Let's go again soon, Oppo. That would just be wonderful. Well, take care, mate. All the best to you. Bob, shout out your books before we go and just explain what they're about. We, uh, 12 years ago, we wrote a non-fiction book called The Circuit. And it's basically to do with the security circuit, the privatisation of war, and how my feelings on the circuit being self-regulated as opposed to what I think it should be, and that is externally regulated. Uh, holding uh, these big companies to account to allow their men and women on the ground to do the job properly with the proper skills. So it, it's a lot of stories about what I got involved in and it makes for what I've been told an interesting read. And then off the back of that doing so well, um, we wrote two books. One is called The Infidel about Afghanistan our vision of Afghanistan, it's my wife and I, and uh, a book, the third book, The Good Jihadist, about the West's involvement in Pakistan and Afghanistan. With interesting characters. Are there any films on the horizon about your books, Bob? They sound... There is, uh, I mean, I'm talking at the moment and have been for some time, COVID didn't help, um, for The Infidel. The Infidel is a modern day take on Kipling's The Man Who Would Be King. 
And of course, there's that great 70s film with Sean Connery and Michael Caine. Well, these are two ex-SAS guys who worked the circuit, got themselves in a bit of a bind and are working their way out of it. And it runs the lines of the man who would be king. So it's a great read. Yes. No okay, mate. If you ever need anybody to play you in, in one of these films, then, you know, look no further, mate. Well, I was thinking that. I mean, you're young enough, you know, you've got the good looks. Wow. You look hard as nails at the same time, so which I'm not, of course. I might but... have to have a week, a week though. No, oh, you've just spoiled it now. <laughs> okay, take care. I got to get a new wig because this one's getting a hole in it. <laughs> All the best to you. Brother, I'll see you soon. Just stay on the line. To everybody at home, massive love to you. All. Look after yourselves. Please like and subscribe, and you'll find Bob's links below. Cheers, cheers.